Hello, Curbsiders. I wanted to remind you that this Friday, we are kicking off the first of four Nef Madness-themed episodes. So keep an eye out for that, and each episode will feature a wonderful kidney-themed pun sent in by you, the listeners. Thank you for that, and enjoy the show. Is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those, and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash-like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible to screw up. We should always do your own homework and let us know when we're ready. This episode of The Curbsiders is sponsored by the American College of Physicians, a professional society for internists with over 154,000 members. For a limited time, post-training docs save $100 on their first year membership dues. Visit acponline.org forward slash join and use the cur- code CURB100 to get your discount. That's what was C-U-R- that code again? That's C-U-R-B 100. Are there any spaces in that? <laughs> no spaces. Hey, Paul, we're back. <laughs> Did you actually interrupt yourself? <laughs> I No, I, I think I was just speaking. Okay. So, uh, Paul, this this is the Curbsiders, and you're going to tell people what we do. Uh, tonight, it's, it's just me and you and our wonderful guest. Uh, Stuart couldn't make it tonight. He is on a busy inpatient service, but uh, he's with us in spirit, Paul. I always. I, I carry Stuart in my heart. Um <laughs> So we are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And we also like to talk to our guests at the very beginning just to learn about them, what makes them tick, and how they relax. Um, I think no chiding this time around. Um, and you already hopefully know that our, our guest this time around. He's, he's been on one of our earlier Peabody Awarding episodes. Um, so this part will be a little bit shorter. But if you want to skip past it, just look to the show notes for your timestamps. In this episode, you'll hear all about the cirrhotic patient with decompensated cirrhosis, or is it acute on chronic liver liver failure? We'll talk about some of that terminology. We'll talk about variceal bleeding, hepatic encephalopathy. We talk about coagulopathy in cirrhosis and uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Just a ton of really interesting physiology stuff. Lots of pearls from Dr. Matherly walking us through how he interprets labs. I mean, this episode just has so much great stuff in it. Um, and to remind you, our wonderful guest, Dr. Scott Matherly, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at VCU in Richmond, Virginia. He is a board-certified internist and boarded in gastroenterology and transplant he- transplant hepatology. He completed medical school at the University of South Carolina, residency at Johns Hopkins, and completed his fellowship training in GI and transplant hepatology at VCU. As a member of the faculty at VCU, he has been recognized no fewer than five times as VCU's uh, as VCU School of Medicine's best teacher. In addition to his teaching responsibilities, Dr. Matherly is a co-director of the multidisciplinary hepatocellular cancer clinic in the Hume Lee Transplant Center. And I can't wait for everyone to hear this wonderful discussion. And pun. <laughs> Scott, we are thrilled to have you back. This is a huge topic, one that terrified me during training and, to be honest, still terrifies me <laughs> more than it should. Well, actually, I think it's a terrifying condition, so we're going we're gonna to ask you for a lot of advice. I hope you're ready. I'm ready. I'm <laughs> ready. Figured. Looking forward to it. Yeah. You, you're going to live up to your Twitter handle tonight, which is at liverprof for, for those of you at home. Can you give us a one-liner, Scott, to def- uh, just kind of remind the audience who you are? Yeah, I'm a 44-year-old father of two. I have an eight-year-old son and a five-year-old daughter. I also have a rescue pup. I'm a single dad. I'm dating a beautiful physical therapist. (laughs) I'm a keto practitioner and a novice weightlifter. But I'm also a transplant hepatologist on the side as well. (laughs) Good. It's important to have hobbies. There's so many follow-up questions. Wait, I don't (laughs) think you told us you were a keto practitioner last time. Yeah, yeah, I'm a lot skinnier than I was last time I saw you guys. Yeah, <laughs> tell us, tell us about the keto thing. Like, is uh, it, a, is it a, um, yeah, like, is this good for the liver? 
Uh, maybe we'll just start there. <laughs> <laughs> well, my expert opinion would be, yes, it is good for the liver. I, okay. um, weight loss is good for the liver. Sure. You know, I, I think when it comes to dietary science, it's remarkably uh, difficult to figure out what the right thing to do is. So I, I always advocate for folks to do what, what works for them. And so far, the keto diet has worked for me. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I enjoy being on it. And I've lost a boatload of weight. So I, I'm sticking with it. Oh, congrats. Excellent. That's great. If if an audience member wanted to get on the keto diet, is there like a particular resource that they could use to learn about it the way that you did? Or uh, you know, I really learned about it through a physician at work uh, who has a weight loss clinic, and um, I, I didn't necessarily go to the weight loss clinic, but we sit in clinic together every Wednesday and, and talked about it sort of a lot. There, there's tons of stuff out there these days. It's an extremely popular diet. Yeah, uh, fairly fairly simple overall, uh, really. Uh, just a, a low carb high fat sort of diet sounds a little crazy on the face to be honest with you but it actually works fairly well it's good for my irritable bowel syndrome too for <laughs> anybody out there with the uh with the irritable bowels and how how ocd are you but now i, I know we're going down the rabbit hole with this sorry wado but like are you to the point like i know that some of it is actually monitoring whether or not you're generating ketones like have you gone that far into it or is it just a matter of eating the foods that are are sort of part of the diet no i'm, I'm a very ocd kind of guy uh but I, I refuse to make it that complicated um, I, from the very beginning. I I set some guidelines about things that I shouldn't be eating. Uh, I don't weigh things. I don't measure things. And to be honest with you, I don't worry about it if I eat too many carbs in one day. I just I, I stay away from stuff. But I don't, I'm not dipsticking my urine looking for ketones. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess that was the question I was dancing around for whatever reason. No. Yeah. I, I, I think some people go crazy. I, I think you can even get like a continuous – monitor that sort of monitors the ketones and everything yeah. yep. uh similar to a continuous glucose monitor so crazy stuff all right well <laughs> uh i'm glad you're enjoying that i i don't know i I've, i mean i've read about it we actually uh are so disappointed we have a guest hopefully we'll be having this guest uh later in 2019 um, he, he's an expert on the keto diet he lived on it for several years he's a physician and uh, he's also ta knows all about like intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding. I'm really interested in this stuff. So uh, look out for that later in 2019. Yeah, it would be a great episode. It's very hot right now. All right. So Paul, speaking of hot right now, why don't you give one of your <laughs> why don't you give one of your your famous hot takes on a pick uh, of the week? I'm excited for this one because um, usually you know I do a pretentious movie that no one actually enjoys. Um, Side note, one of my colleagues actually followed up one of my movie recommendations and made a point to seek me out to tell me he hated the movie. So that so it's always nice to hear from our fans. Um, so it's usually a you know high float movie or book. This time around, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna recommend the History Channel program Truck Night in America, which is one of my <laughs> all time favorite shows. Have, do you have any idea about this, Matt? No, no. Scott, have you heard of this? Truck Night in America. It sounds amazing. It is fabulous. It is. It starts out with four contestants who basically soup up their trucks. They bring them in from home, and they you know they're all jacked up in these gigantic tires, and they're a bazillion horsepower, and they're put through this insane obstacle course in a competition um, to eliminate them until the last driver goes through this thing called the Green Hell, um, which is like this insane mountain of mud and like rickety roller coaster type things. Like the whole thing is just an excuse to just beat these trucks to death, and half the time they're exploding and stuff, and it's it's just almost zen like how much I enjoy it. I just sit and watch people beat up their trucks for an hour, and it is. Fantastic. So if you're tired of thinking and just want to watch trucks like do jumps and move around in mud, then I would recommend Truck Night in America. Truck Night in America. Got it. I uh I can't I cannot say that I've seen that before. Um okay. The History Channel's <sighs> killing it because they do the forged in fire too, like the blacksmithing competition where they have to make these blades that then and then prove how actually sharp they are. Like there's all kinds of amazing game shows for lack of a better term on the history channel. So if you have some time to kill and you're tired of Netflix documentaries, head on over, take a look. I'm going to give, I'm, I'm going to give that actually a TV show recommendation. Paul, I was texting you about this the other night. I really, I, I'm a huge fan of like time travel, groundhogs day, happy death day. Uh, this, this is this new Netflix show, Russian doll. It came out February 1st and it's a really cool show. Like the soundtrack, I like the main character Natasha Leone. It's just a it's a it's a great show, and so I would recommend it. It's eight episodes. They're only like twenty five minutes, which kind of 
checks off my, you can't ruin too much of your time with it uh, or waste too much time with it. And hopefully it'll be back for some other seasons. Scott, did you have any sort of pick of the week? You know, guys, I live a very sheltered life. <laughs> I just work and and read. But no, I the thing that uh, I'm really enjoying right now, and this may sound incredibly stupid, is uh, weightlifting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I, you know, I've, I've always hated exercise. I've always been a chubby boy my whole life and I always hated cardio and always find reasons not to do it. But I decided to start trying lifting weights and I have this simple little app on my phone called the strong lifts five by five app. And I have absolutely loved it. And it's really changed me uh, a lot. I go to the gym three times a week. I'm happy as a peach lifting weights, getting me some muscles, which I never had before. Uh, so maybe maybe if you have trouble with your fitness, just try a different a different way. But that's my hot pick for the week. I like it. This so this app that you're mentioning the the five is it are they kind of Olympic lifts like deadlift, squat, like those yeah, like so sort of. It's very simple. That's the other thing that I like. It's basically three exercises that you do um, in alternating. So you always do squats every time, uh, and then you alternate deadlift and. Uh, and uh, overhead press, bench press, and uh, and uh, barbell row, and so it's very simple. Three three exercises each time. You do five reps, five sets, and that's it. Simple. I, I that sounds great. My brother in law is a strength and training coach, and uh, he talks about that. This I think this would would meet his approval. He talks about those basically those exercises: a push, a pull. A hinge at the hips and squats. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, this, these, these are all compound, hit hit all the major motions. Yeah. Stuart, I believe we have a sponsor for tonight's episode. That's right. It's the American College of Physicians, or ACP for short. That's right, Stuart. The ACP is the largest medical specialty society in the world. There are chapters in every state, which means tons of opportunities for all our listeners to get involved in meetings, to go and learn, to network with colleagues, and to add their voice to the advocacy discussions that are going on at home. Also, the ACP is just always doing things at a national level, whether it's trying to improve the mock process, they're lobbying Congress for things like reducing administrative burden, or just putting out policy papers. And for that reason, I am proud to be a member of the ACP, not just because of the policy statement issues, but also because of their attempts to reduce physician burnout, which is a huge thing for me. In fact, with all of that in mind, there are so many benefits from membership, like the annals of internal medicine in the clinic and beyond the guidelines. And members also get discounts on critical lifelong learning resources like MixUp and uh, the annual internal medicine meeting. Wink, wink. <laughs> Yeah, plus there's lots of CME and mock opportunities, not just our show, other sh- other shows, other CME and learning activities through the ACP. So in summary, no matter what your career stage or practice setting, ACP can support your needs. And for a limited time, post-training docs can save $100 on their first membership dues. Visit acponline.org forward slash join and use the code CURB, C-U-R-B, 100, no spaces, to get your discount. Okay, so now you would you would not know that we were going to talk about cirrhosis based on <laughs> <laughs> and that's based, our show. Thanks, based everybody. on the last ten minutes of conversation, which I have thoroughly enjoyed. But at this point, I'm I'm going to ask Paul if he would be so kind as to start us off with a case from Cash Lack and and throw you the first question. I'd be happy to. So let's talk about Mr. Keith. Mr. Keith is a 45 year old male. He's got a past history of alcoholic cirrhosis, also past history of hepatitis C. Uh, former smoker, uh, cigarette smoker, 40 pack years total, who presents to Cashlack, brought in by his family uh, with concerns for altered mental status, everyone's favorite diagnosis. Um, he also vomited blood this morning and was found confused in his bathroom. His wife reports that his stools have been dark for the past couple of days. On examination, he's tachycardic. His heart rate is in 115, blood pressure 92 over 55, setting 92% on room air, and his temperature is 97.6 degrees. His wife says he may have had fevers or chills yesterday, but who can tell? And we didn't actually check his temperature. And then the initial ER labs that we get back is a hemoglobin of 9, platelet counts that's still cooking, um, which is always a great sign, white count of 13.5, creatinine of 1, BUN of 42, potassium of 3. Uh, he's hyponatremic with a sodium of 127, a bicarb of 17, chloride of 97, albumin of 2.5, total bilia of 5.6, and an INR of 1.7. And this is... Already a boatload of information for you. 
like a really scary board question. <laughs> yeah, right. Absolutely. <laughs> where you just hope refer is actually one of the options. <laughs> you know, where where is this one going? But for you, you have this patient who comes in with altered sensorium and this history of of already known liver disease. So can you just talk us through your your initial approach for the patient, starting maybe even with the history? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, with this kind of patient, it's a little overwhelming uh, due to the uh, very significant possibilities of badness going on with him, right? So uh, with him, I'd want to figure out some things fairly quickly um, from hopefully his family members since he's altered. You know, things like, is he on blood thinners? What NSAIDs? You know, something like that. Has he been taking medicines that would alter his sensorium like benzodiazepine or narcotics? Has he had any recent alcohol or substance abuse? And has he fallen? Uh, so when somebody comes in altered uh, with an, with assumed encephalopathy, oftentimes, especially with alcoholism as their underlying liver disease, you have to worry about falls and subarachnoid hemorrhages and subdural hemorrhages and stuff like that. So, uh, those are sort of some quick things that I would want to try to figure out while I'm trying to figure out what to do with this guy. What do you think of his labs? Well, I think his labs are very concerning. Uh, the few things that immediately pop out to my mind, I, as a hepatologist, is his albumin uh, is very low, suggesting fairly advanced liver disease. Uh, he's he's quite jaundiced, and I don't know what his baseline is. Um his sodium being low is a big red flag for me. Uh, this often uh, portends hepatorenal type physiology going on with these people, and and he would be fairly high risk for going into renal failure. Uh, and he's obviously anemic and altered. The other thing that kind of jumps out is his BUN being elevated. Uh, that often makes me think that you know maybe he's ingested a blood meal, if you will, uh, and may have an upper GI bleed, but you kind of gotten from your history anyway. And exam wise, any anything specific that you pay attention to in this guy? Like you spend you spend a lot of time looking for asterixis, things like that. No, I don't really. I mean, from my standpoint, this guy is critically ill, and and as a hepatologist, I'd be work, worrying about what can I do to keep this guy from dying, right? So, so really, it's very very back to basics, which is the ABCs: airway, breathing, circulation. This guy's airway is a big concern uh, to me, and it should be with any time cirrhotic comes in altered, because aspiration is going to equal death for these people. So you, you have to be very careful if they're obtunded, if they're vomiting. I have a very low threshold to get ICU teamed down here and get this guy intubated um he's vitals is he stable or unstable this guy does not look stable to me he's tachycardic he's uh hypotensive and that i mean that suggests a significant blood loss somewhere in 15 to 40 percent if this is if if this is uh bleeding uh or this could be septic shock this is another thing that he needs resuscitation uh, fairly aggressively as for physical exam, I you know I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time looking for asterixis in this guy. Um, pretty obviously, uh, probably encephalopathic. But I am going to be looking for things like does he have ascites? Does he not have ascites? Are there any signs of infection? Does he have you know are his lungs clear? Uh, those sort of things. Uh, in the acute setting like this, I don't spend a lot of time you know worrying about whether they have spider angiomas or not. <laughs> yeah, and I guess that was a question I have in, in doing some of the reading. And maybe we'll get a little bit more to this later about sort of the, the grading of hepatic encephalopathy. Is there a whole lot of utility in fussing around with that stuff, or is it more just a matter of making sure the patient's stable is kind of what I'm hearing? Yeah, in this setting, I think it's much more important to make sure the patient is, is stable. Uh, really, with the encephalopathy, your your decision tree here is, does, does this patient need to be intubated, or is this somebody that we can try to wake up um, on, on a step-down unit or something like that? Can you, before we kind of go into the the acute management of this patient and any further kind of workup we're going to send. Can you talk to us a little bit about this terminology of decompensated cirrhosis, acute on chronic liver failure? How should we talk about this among colleagues and when we're communicating with you as a hepatologist? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And there was actually a, a whole conference on this back in 2015 called the Bovino Conference, where we really uh, wanted, we endeavored to adequately define cirrhosis and its stages. And it and they came up with uh, several different terminologies, okay? And one, one is compensated cirrhosis. So this is your cirrhotic patient who doesn't have ascites, encephalopathy, varices, variceal bleeding. Um, they are, you would otherwise not even know that they had cirrhosis potentially. They're doing well. 
Uh, these people have a, can live 10 to 20 years with their cirrhosis as their lifespan, and they're broken down based on this criteria into those with portal hypertension that's mild or those that have clinically significant portal hypertension, and those people are broken down into those who have varices or don't have varices. That's not too terribly important uh, for non-hepatologists, but the bottom line is that compensative cirrhosis is that's your patient who maybe has cirrhosis and is showing up with a diabetic foot ulcer or something like that in, in the emergency room. Decompensated cirrhosis is somebody that has now developed one of the big complications of cirrhosis, and that's ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, or a variceal bleed. And this is a big inflection point, right? So if they go if they go from compensated cirrhotic to uncompensated cir or, or decompensated cirrhotic, that's a big prognostic milestone because their survival is automatically going to be much, much shorter than a compensated cirrhotic, somewhere in the neighborhood of one to two years instead of 10 to 20 years. And this is the point where you really need to start wondering if this person is going to need a liver transplant or is there anything else we can do to abort this kind of process before it advances. But even further beyond that, they, they have the very what they term the late decompensated cirrhotic. So this is really where our patient would be described as a late decompensated cirrhotic. These are people with recurrent variceal bleeds, refractory ascites, hepatorenal syndrome, recurrent encephalopathy, or jaundice. And these people have very high levels of, of, of mortality and really need a consideration for transplant. But even then, our patient was a decompensated cirrhotic probably at baseline, even though we don't really know. But what he really has right now is acute on chronic liver failure. And this, this is an important concept, an important terminology that even in my short period of time as a hepatologist has been argued about. And quite honestly, every, every society on earth has its own separate definition of this entity. But basically what this is, is this is a syndrome of acute decompensation of a patient with prior underlying liver disease characterized by the development of liver failure plus one or more extra hepatic organ failures. So the way I think about this is you got somebody with some kind of underlying liver disease, and it has, doesn't have to be cirrhosis. I mean, you, you, this could happen in a patient with chronic hepatitis C, somebody with alcoholic you know, fatty liver disease. It doesn't matter. But something happens to them, and their liver goes from being okay to failing. And, and the way we characterize by failing is that they become jaundiced. Their INR elongates. They, they, they develop an elevated INR way above their baseline significantly okay so if their normal bilirubin is 1.3 and they come in at 5.6 that's a significant increase in their bilirubin suggesting liver failure and if you add on to that another organ failure so with our patient uh, the hepatic encephalopathy would be considered cns failure um, the hypotension is, is cardiovascular failure the aki would be renal failure so the these additional organ failures would suggest this patient has now acute on chronic liver failure. And the, and the significance of that is that mortality is very significant even in hospital. So about 50% of people with acute on chronic liver failure will die in the hospital before they leave. So you got about a half a penny a coin flips chance of getting out of the hospital when you come in with acute on chronic liver failure. It only accounts for about 5% of admissions with cirrhosis. Uh, so if you just get admitted with ascites or you just get admitted with SBP, that doesn't mean you have acute on chronic liver failure. Acute on chronic liver failure, you have to have jaundice, worsened INR, plus some or other organ, fail organ going down as a result of the liver failure. And I think our patient meets that criteria. It is an important distinction between that and just decompensated cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And are any of these definitions fluid? So can you, can you walk back? So if someone comes in as maybe not late decompensated, but just decompensated and you sort of fix the underlying derangement, can you move backwards to compensated or are you sort of almost like healing pressure ulcers where once you're a stage four, you're always a stage four? Well, traditionally, we don't think so. I mean, we, we if somebody became, you know, a decompensated cirrhotic with ascites, we would just consider them a decompensated cirrhotic forever. And if, if you look at our notes, that's what we'll say forever, decompensated cirrhotic. But, but you can do certain things to these people that can dramatically improve their liver function. If they're an alcoholic and they're alcohol is what's really driving their liver disease and they stop drinking, we can see dramatic improvements, even in short periods of time. People can go from being jaundiced and bellies full of fluid to having no ascites, no jaundice. And then three, three years later, you're still going to call them a decompensated cirrhotic when they have normal albumins or everything else is fine. No, I, at some point, they probably become a compensated cirrhotic again. Same thing with hep C treatment. We see this time and time again. People 
uh, people with uh, even on transplant lists get treated with hepatitis C, and their liver function improvement over the years after that is dramatic sometimes. And do they become compensated yet? I guess they do. I don't know exactly when you start calling them compensated again, probably when you realize that, hey, it's been three years since they had ascites or something like that. I want to move forward with the case. Let's say that we start doing some basic things for Mr. Keith. We He gets two large bore IVs. Uh, he's we start we we give him a little bit of fluid and maybe you can comment on on what what, what fluid you might give for the hypotension and how much and uh, he starts bleeding again right in the ER so we we call you Scott and you're gonna take this guy for EGD you see that he's got some large bleeding varices so you ban them so what else you know as that all is happening what other treatments might we be giving him in the ER to stabilize him as he's on his way to the endoscopy suite or the ICU for you to do at bedside, wherever it's going to be done? Well, a couple of things I would say when we're still doing our workup lab-wise that I would advocate for, and that's um, really uh, looking for infection uh, in these people is very important. Um, and we will talk about SBP probably in a little while, but you know, my, my old uh, saying with cirrhotics is that any cirrhotic admitted with any complaint who has ascites has SBP until you prove that they don't. Uh, I think that's uh, wise words to live by because SBP kills and it's hard to diagnose sometimes. Um, very protean manifestations when they're admitted. Uh, ABGs, blood cultures, uh, urine cultures, chest x-ray, make sure you're not missing an infection on these people. And I would kind of advocate against a couple of tests, and I, I think that's important too. I I think it's extremely unhelpful uh, to be doing hemocults on people who come in with melanoma or have a history of throwing up blood with a hemoglobin 9. Not important. Hemocult is a screening test for colorectal cancer, and in this setting, I think we can assume that he's having a GI bleed. And then ammonia levels. And uh, this is a pet peeve of mine. I um, whenever, whenever I'm rounding and a medical student or resident tells me that they've, the ammonia level is X on, on said cirrhotic patient, I hiss at them like a cat. And, and, um, and I keep making hissing noises whenever they mention ammonia because it's a, a really, really not a test that is, uh, indicated or useful. I actually tweeted about this today. Uh, if, if you guys see me on, on Twitter, um, especially in this setting right right here when you have a cirrhotic who's severely decompensated and obviously encephalopathic sending an ammonia level adds zero to that conversation uh, encephalopathy is a clinical diagnosis not a lab diagnosis and the reason i'm so so grumpy about this is because i see it lead to harm of patients and this, this is this is what bothers me is i see people drawing ammonia levels every week on their patient and making them take insane amounts of lactulose and having tremendous diarrhea just because their ammonia level is 64 that day, you know, rather than looking at the patient and seeing that they're not confused or whatever. There are a couple of clinical situations where the ammonia level is useful. Um, and I, I will say in adults, I, you know, I don't deal with kids, but urea cycle disorders in kids, it, it can be useful, but I, I don't see those. Um, but in adults, if you have somebody who doesn't have cirrhosis, who has encephalopathy, who's altered and you don't know why, an ammonia level in that setting can be useful because there are certain things, certain drugs that can cause elevated ammonia levels, which can lead to encephalopathy. So it's worth investigating then. If you have a patient with acute liver failure, say somebody comes in with a Tylenol overdose or something like that, the ammonia level is beneficial there because it can tell you the risk of brainstem herniation. So it has some prognost- prognostic abilities in that setting. But in a cirrhotic patient, it's never useful and I never want it drawn ever. So I, I went on a tangent there. It's it's a pet peeve. What can I say? All I, right. So you were, you were asking me what else should we do, right? With, the, with regards to fluid and everything. I would say resuscitation is very important here. Um, before you uh, call in the cavalry to come in with our endoscopes and, and throw some rubber bands on this gentleman, we need, we need him resuscitated a little bit um, we don't want anybody to die because of conscious sedation for uh, an upper endoscopy that makes us twitchy, and there's a lot of paperwork involved. So um, we, um, so getting the patient resuscitated with with fluids and blood is important. Now, what kind of fluids to use? I, I, I don't know that the, there's a right answer for that. I would probably just advocate for plain old crystalloid. It, now is not the time to worry about, is are they going to third space that into ascites? You know, sure, they might later on. You can deal with that later on. You need to get their blood pressure up. 
Uh, I don't think giving them 25% albumin right now is going to effectively get his blood pressure up. So I, I, I would, I would bolus him with crystalloid and blood. So the blood transfusions, um, there, there is some science to this, um, with regards to variceal bleeding in general, and you don't want to just hammer them with tons of blood and get his hemoglobin up from nine to, uh, uh, 13 or something like that, because that's been shown to increase their risk of recurrent bleeding and, and death. Um, so, uh, the sweet spot for blood transfusions in a cirrhotic patient is seven to nine, and that's uh, that's where we want their hemoglobin to be, um, and not much above that. So you, you have to gingerly uh, transfuse blood uh, in these folks. But mechanistically, oh, why is there, why is their mortality higher if you if you push the blood? Is it just the usual complications of transfusion, or is there another reason that it seems I, to? I think just increased blood. I think just think the increased blood volume leads to increased portal pressures and and probably increases their risk of bleeding. Um, is probably the uh, the pathogenesis of that. For for this patient, would you be starting them on octreotide? Like how how important is that in like the acute setting, or can that wait till after we give the blood, the fluids, and we get this this person banded? No, octreotide is very important in this situation, and it's probably your number one priority. And I'm saying octreotide. I mean, I'm very, I'm being very USA centric here because this, this is another uh, situation where, in the rest of the world, a different agent is used, and that's uh, terlipressin. So, octreotide is obviously a somatostatin analog. Uh, it's given as a bolus followed by a in, in, uh, continuous infusion, and we typically keep it going for three to five days in variceal bleeds. This can acutely decrease portal pressures and and uh, stop the bleeding by itself. So this this is very important and probably the number one priority of a, a agent to hang on these folks, right? So uh, we always want to get the vasoactive uh, substances, either octreotide or terlipressin in other parts of the world, uh, going as soon as possible. The second thing to give them obvious is, is it seems a little unusual is an antibiotic and. Um, in particular, we usually recommend third-generation cephalosporins or higher. So if the patient is super sick and you want to do, you know, uh, some super broad-spectrum antibiotics, that, that's fine, and that'll probably work. Uh, if not, then we usually give something along the lines of ceftriaxone. And you want to give that soon um, because uh, giving the antibiotics during a variceal bleed has been shown to decrease mortality, decrease infections. Uh, and it's just uh, a, a very important part of that. So for me, it's octreotide number one, number two is ceftriaxone, and then obviously the endoscopy within 12 hours uh, to uh, get get some uh, rubber bands on those veins. You notice I haven't said PPI, and I'm sure you're going to ask me about that. But um, uh, proton pump inhibitors don't really have a role. In variceal bleeding, in, in particular, if you look if you look at the variceal guidelines, uh, there's no mention of PPIs. So, um, and that's because you know giving acid suppression is not going to prevent them from bleeding to death from a varix. That being said, most of these folks come in with an upper GI bleed, and you don't know that they're a variceal bleed until we actually do the endoscopy. And many upper GI bleeds do respond to PPIs. Um, and so, giving them on a PPI is pretty standard, and I, I we always do it. But it's not necessarily for the varices itself, and it, it's not necessarily your number one priority. I would say if you're choosing the, do I give them the octreotide or the proton pump inhibitor, I would go with the octreotide first. Octreotide will actually decrease bleeding from other GI bleeding sources like uh, ulcers and stuff like that as well. Um, so it's just a good, a good first choice. PPIs uh, can also benefit you after we band, um, you know. We, we put these rubber bands down in the lower esophagus, and they only stay on there for a day or two usually, and then they, they necrose and fall off, and, and they leave behind them a, a giant ulcer in the lower esophagus. And and those ulcers, uh, if you ever go down there like a week afterwards, it, they're quite impressive sometimes, the, these big, giant ulcers. And if you're think, thinking about they're sitting on these bed of high-pressure blood vessels, it's kind of terrifying to think about, but… Um, How did I not know this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want to know. You don't want to know some of this stuff. But but anyway, there is something called a post a post banding ulcer bleed, and this this can commonly happen within the first week or so after a banding procedure. And and the PPIs actually decrease the incidence of that. So so PPI will be given, um, but um, it's not my number one priority in this situation. I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about the. Uh, octreotide mechanism of action and how, if at all, that differs from terlipressin. 
I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that, <laughs> Dr. Sorry. Watto. I thought you loved what, talking about that. What, what do I look like? Some kind of physiologist? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how. They, somatostatin works by causing vasoconstriction in the mesenteric vasculature, which decreases portal flow, which decreases portal pressure. I don't know the exact mechanism of how it does that, to be honest with you. Uh, terlipressin is a vasopressin analog. It does that more directly by causing, directly causing vasoconstriction of, of the mesenteric vasculature. The nice thing about terlipressin um, is that it also kind of boosts your blood pressure. So um, you, you get kind of a, a increased uh, blood pressure with terli usually when it's given IV. So um, that's basically how they both work, by decreasing portal inflow and decreasing portal pressure as a result. I think that's I think that's plenty. I don't think we need to go to like the molecular okay. level. Uh, that's Whew, that was a great God. that was a I'm great a explanation. All right, all right. So let's let's kind of recap. So we basically we've pan cultured this p- person. We've given them crystalloid. We're giving them blood. We got them octreotide and uh, antibiotic, a third gef- generation cephalosporin or more. So we're sort of stabilizing the patient. They've they've got good IV access. You get we you ban them and create a giant ulcer in their lower esophagus. <laughs> uh, what what what's next for this person? Anything else? We just kind of cross our fingers and hope that they're they're going to be okay. Yeah, well, we keep the octreotide going, like I said, for about three to five days. The 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 antibiotics we typically want to go for five days. Uh, the PPI will depend on what you're what you're kind of dealing with. Uh, but yeah, once they're stabilized. The next thing you really need to worry about is how to prevent this from happening again. Um, and there, there's a couple of ways that you can prevent this from happening again. Uh, one is you can do a TIPS procedure on the patient, right? And so this is, uh, this is kind of a hot topic. And there's been a lot of uh, research about doing what is called an early TIPS after a variceal bleeding. You know, TIPS, for those that don't know, is a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. Uh, it is basically an interventional radiology procedure where they artificially connect the portal vein to the hepatic vein, allowing blood to shunt from the portal vein straight into the vena cava and to the heart without having to go through the knotted up, scarred up liver. Okay, And it, and the immediate result of a TIPS procedure is it decreases portal pressures dramatically, maybe not to normal, but certainly to a level where you don't have variceal bleeding. Another upshot of these is they typically get rid of ascites or make ascites much more manageable. So tips is fun. They're great. But there are a couple of downsides to a tips. Number one is if you're too sick, you're, if your liver's too sick, you can cause your liver to fail by shunting the blood away from the liver and you die. So that's bad. Um, if, you, if you have pulmonary hypertension, they can kill you from the increased preload. So you have to be kind of cognizant of that. And then afterwards, they could, about 30 to 40 percent of people uh, will develop encephalopathy afterwards. And encephalopathy, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, is much more of a shunting phenomenon than 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 people realize. Uh, so if you shunt a significant amount of blood around the liver, they people tend to become encephalopathic. So whether or not to do a TIPS is something you really need a, a hepatologist to kind of help you with. Um, they they've been shown to be really helpful in patients who have very high hepatic venous pressure gradients, very high portal hypertension, uh, greater than 20 millimeters of mercury, and that's typically going to be your child's C cirrhotic or a child's B cirrhotic who is still bleeding even after you've banded them. These are the people we typically think about doing a TIPS right away. Just roll them down to IR and get the TIPS done, okay? Because they they might bleed. That being said, this this isn't universally done and is somewhat controversial, so I, I, I won't necessarily advocate that that be done on everybody. It really needs to be a case-by-case basis. But assuming that we're not going to do a tips on, on the patient, then the next step and, and the most important thing to keep them from bleeding again is to start them on a beta blocker at some point. And this is a, a non-selective beta blocker? Yeah, you absolutely. Have, you have a Non-sel- favorite? Well, there, there's two major ones that we use in the United States, and that's propranolol and natalol. Um, propranolol is twice a day, um, and natalol is once a day. So we like natalol because it's once a day, and we probably think compliance is better. But really, between the two, it doesn't really matter. Carvedilol is also used for varices, and you'll you'll certainly see uh, patients on carvedilol for primary prophylaxis of varices. But as it stands right now, carvedilol is not recommended as as a secondary prophylaxis beta blocker. Um, and so uh, at this point, we typically are just going to use propranolol or natalol. When to start these guys is is always a, a hot question because these people are coming out of the ICU. They're pretty sick and hypotensive. Obviously, you need them to be kind of stabilized from a cardiovascular standpoint before you go putting them on a non-selective beta blocker. 
Okay. And if uh, I usually, usually around the time that they come out of the ICU is when we want to start them on. We start them on a low dose, so maybe 10 milligrams twice a day of propranolol or something like that. And we just work it up as tolerated. Your goal is not to get their blood pressure down. Your goal is to get their pulse down. Okay. And it, we really want their pulses to be in the 50 to 60 range uh, or a 25% reduction in their, in their basal heart rate. Um, Beta blockers also have some potential downsides in cirrhotics and people with refractory ascites. And for the most part, we don't recommend their use if their systolic blood pressures are 90 or less. Okay. And I'm, uh, there's probably a thousand internists out there going, duh. But, uh, but you know, cirrhotic patients, you know, 95 systolic blood pressure is not unusual for these folks. I think this might be just where they live. And so um, having them on a little bit of beta blocker because they're their systolic blood pressure is 98 um, is, is okay. But if that systolic blood pressure is 88, you probably don't want them on a beta blocker. And the bottom line is if the, if they can't tolerate a beta blocker, because this is so important for keeping them from bleeding again, then this is somebody that should be considered for a TIPS. I, I had read that once someone has SBP, beta blockers are no longer an option, that there's increased mortality. Is that, is that true? Should we, is that a sort of time to stop them? No, no, not necessarily. Um, there, there's conflicting data on that, and uh, I don't think uh, that that question has been adequately answered at this point. And Scott, I want to ask, um, you had mentioned actually a child score, which reminded me of a question I wanted to ask you way, way earlier, is when these patients initially present, you often hear um, either a child score reported or a MELD score. And I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind speaking a little bit to the prognostication that's done when someone sort of comes in acutely sick with, with a liver complication. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, we have a variety of scoring mechanisms out there to kind of give us uh, a sense for whether patients will survive. The thing to kind of remember is that none of these have been created for the acute cirrhotic patient entering the emergency room with a variceal bleed, okay? Uh, from my standpoint, I don't spend a lot of time in the emergency room wondering what their MELD score is and whether I should be doing this, that, or another. This is more of an ac uh, acute thing. The The when we were first looking at how to tell whether a cirrhotic is going to live or die, the first thing that came out was the child turcot pew score, and this was this was way back. Uh, and this utilizes several parameters, um, plus the presence and absence of ascites and hepatic encephalopathy to give you a score as an A, B, or C. Now, roughly, a child C cirrhotic is a significantly decompensated cirrhotic, and a child's A cirrhotic is a compensated cirrhotic. Child score has kind of fallen by the wayside um, as, as uh, a usefulness. It used to be used to kind of prognosticate who's going to live or die with abdominal surgeries and this sort of thing. But at this point, it's mostly uh, used as sort of a functional status type, type thing. The MELD score has really uh, become the dominant way of predicting prognosis in, in cirrhotic patients. And the MELD score, MELD stands for Model for End-Stage Liver Disease. And this was... This was created in the 1990s at the Mayo Clinic. Um, it utilizes the uh, INR, the creatinine, and the bilirubin uh, to spit out a number somewhere between 7 and 40, and 7 being normal, 40 being sort of death's door liver failure. And the MELT score has been shown to be useful across a broad do domain of, of liver diseases for prognostication, but mostly for prognosticating who's going to be alive or dead in 90 days, okay? And not, not necessarily who's going to be alive or dead in seven days, all right? So the MELT score isn't, isn't uh, really fantastic in a short interval type patient like this. There is a scoring system that can be useful in the acute setting, and that, is, uh, that goes back to that definition of acute on chronic liver failure. Uh, and there is a score called the ACLF CLIF score, a CLIF score that was developed out of the CLIF consortium in Europe. Um, this is a modified SOFA score, which is sequen sequential organ failure assessment score, um, that can be utilized to predict uh, mortality in patients who have acute on chronic liver failure. And I frequently use this in like the ICU setting. Uh, when we're thinking about, is this somebody we're going to keep moving forward trying to do this, that, or the other, is, or is this uh, someone that's not going to survive no matter what we do? But really, for the day-to-day -day cirrhotic who rolls in with some complication in the emergency room, I, I don't spend a lot of time doing scoring things, trying to figure out their, their, whether they're going to live or die. Paul, why don't you move us on through the case? Because I, I, I want to make sure we have time to get to all these various segments that we have planned. We, got, we, we have a lot, lot to go. 
Yeah, and I love this one. So let's we're going to change the case up a little bit. So happily, Mr. Keith isn't bleeding. So all we talked about is completely moot. Um, put it out of your mind now. Instead, he's admitted with abdominal pain and encephalopathy. His blood pressure is low, but stable. His heart rate's in the 90s. He's not been febrile. His exam shows bilateral large extremity edema and tense ascites with a thin-walled umbilical hernia. It takes several tries to engage him, but eventually he follows the exam and mumbles some short answers that are sometimes relevant. He does have asterixis. Um, and so your intern is writing admission orders and asks if the patient needs DVT prophylaxis. Of note, the patient's lab show an INR of 2.1 without the benefit of any medications to get it there. Um, so I, I guess what we're asking you and trying to set you up for is could you talk to us a little bit about the, the bleeding or thrombotic risks in patients with cirrhosis and how should we sort of manage uh, venous thrombotic prophylaxis in the inpatient setting and how should we sort of think about this problem um, more broadly? Well, you guys are hitting me with the easy questions tonight, right? <laughs> just, just just explain coagulopathy of cirrhosis. All right. All right. <laughs> yes, right. So is the patient at risk for clotting? Is the patient at risk for bleeding? The answer is that they're at risk for both. Okay, this is this is part of the fun of cirrhosis. They they get it bad on both ends. Do cirrhotics bleed? Yeah, I think we just saw them earlier in the case bleeding, right? From varices, they bleed from portal hypertensive gastropathy. They tend to bleed, but their bleeds tend to be more pr pressure phenomenon, right? I mean, uh, this this is from portal pressures being really high and blood vessels literally bursting from pressure. That's that's what a variceal bleed is. Uh, variceal bleeds are not coagulopathy issues. They're not bleeding because they're over anticoagulated. They're bleeding because that blood vessel literally burst uh, as a result of increased pressures. Okay. But cirrhotics also clot. Now, you know, there's some data that cirrhotics get DVTs at higher rates than than average uh, patients in the hospital. But that data has been somewhat uh, um, I don't know, what is the word I'm looking for? It's controversial, right? Some some of the data says they do. Some of the data doesn't say they do. Um, but what we do know that they get very frequently is portal vein thrombosis, okay? So these people get, they get clots in the portal vein. About 10 to 25% of cirrhotics will end up with a portal vein thrombosis. So we, we know that they clot there fairly frequently. So should I prophylax them for DVTs? My answer to that is probably yes, okay? I would say that this is just expert opinion. but um, in, in our hospital, we put our patients on anoxaparin or heparin DVT prophylaxis unless they have some reason not to, like their platelet count is just simply too low to do that, okay? Um, because they can very easily get a DVT. They can very easily get portal vein thrombus, and portal vein thrombus is potentially devastating complication in a sick cirrhotic. A nice illustration of this and, and an illustration of whether they can be anticoagulated or not it was a very – one of my favorite studies of all time in hepatology was uh, in hepatology in 2011 by Villa and colleagues um, in in uh, Europe. Uh, basically, they put cirrhotic patients on anoxaparin prophylaxis so that they didn't develop portal vein thrombosis. This was a randomized control trial. So half the folks got the anoxaparin, half the patients got uh, placebo. But what they found is there's no cha no difference in the bleeding between the two groups. The anoxaparin group didn't bleed more than the non-anoxaparin group, and there was no portal vein thrombosis development in the in the anoxaparin group. So it worked. It worked great. But what they didn't expect, and what was really amazing, was that the anoxaparin group had less episodes of decompensation, and they had increased survival compared to the patients that did not get anoxaparin. And so that suggests that you know. Anticoagulation in a cirrhotic may even be beneficial in, in some ways. And so this is why I don't hesitate to put people on DVT prophylaxis if they have cirrhosis, and, unless there's a big uh, reason not to. Wow. Do that's... you have a platelet threshold that makes you nervous? We've been focusing kind of on the INR, but thrombocytopenia being part of it, too. Is there, is there a level where you start to get a little bit squirrely about starting? Yeah, for me, the platelet thing, the, the platelet level that gets me start squirrely is 50 to 60 if, if they're much below that then you then that's when their bleeding risk increases um and uh we can talk about that a little bit more when we get more into the meat of the coagulopathy here but um yeah the platelets i do worry about if they get much lower than 50 i i've seen ir <clears throat> interventional radiology they'll do a paracentesis even even on someone with an inr around if it's Two plus or minus a couple points, they might like two point one. They would do it. I, I don't see them like reversing. Do you have any sort of threshold for that sort of procedures 
if someone's going for surgery. Um, I would uh, I would like to give a high five to your interventional radiologist <laughs> because I would say that that's not the usual practice, no. uh, at, at least in my um, – there's a couple of problems. The thing to understand about coagulopathy and cirrhosis is that this is a complicated problem. So the liver makes all of your blood's clotting factors, right, except for factor eight. Factor eight's made mostly by the endothelial cells, but the liver makes them all. All the other ones come from the liver, so they all tend to be low in chronic liver disease. But what people don't kind of think about is the liver also makes most of your blood's anticoagulation factors as well, right? So it makes protein C, it makes protein S, it makes antithrombin. And the the end result of this is that you have an overall balance. You have low clotting factors, but you also have low anticoagulant factors. And they're pretty balanced, so they're, they're not clotting or they're not bleeding. But because it's a tenuous balance with low factors on both sides, they can easily tip in one direction or another. So they can easily be tipped maybe an infection or something like that may make them bleed, whereas maybe some slow blood flow in the portal vein will make them clot. It, it's a very tenuous balance one way or another. So how do we figure out, you know, are they a bleeder or are they a clotter? It's difficult, and I will tell you that the INR is a very inadequate measure of study of the risk of bleeding and cirrhosis. Okay, the INR is the most sensitive test for liver function that we have, and it has the most power in the MELD score. Um, it, it tells us if the liver is working or not, but it doesn't tell us if they're going to bleed or not. And basically, that's because it measures the, you know, the the clotting factor deficiencies and in, in the coagulation cascade, but it doesn't measure the anticoagulant deficiencies because it doesn't have thrombomodulin in the assay, so protein C activity cannot be measured by the INR. As a result, you're only measuring one side, so you're only seeing the the bleedy side, but not the anti-bleedy side. Okay, and and so the INR we we just can't really use. Um, I think of the INR as, as basically man, uh, showing you their relative factor seven deficiency. And, and factor seven is the one that tends to get the lowest because it has the shortest half-life of all the factors. And, you know, you can give recombinant factor seven to these folks and completely reverse their INR very, very quickly. Okay. And so does that help? And there's actually been a couple of good studies on this where um, in one variceal bleeding study, they gave patients recombinant factor seven to reverse their INR. And there was no difference between the people who had their INRs reversed with recombinant seven with regards to bleeding, mortality, anything. Okay. They also gave recombinant factor seven to people going into liver transplant. And guess what? There's no difference between the people that got recombinant seven or the people that did not get their coagulopathy reversed before transplant when it came to bleeding blood products, anything like that. Okay, so it doesn't work. Making the INR better doesn't fix anything with regards to bleeding. So that's why we don't do it. So to get to your initial question, do I look at the INR before I do a paracentesis or simple procedure? And the answer is no. I don't even pay it any attention. I don't care if the INR is 6 or 1.6. It doesn't make a hill of beans difference to me. That being said, I do paracentesis on fully anticoagulated patients, so I, I don't really consider paracentesis to be a terribly bleedy procedure to begin with. Um, but it's really, you can't use the INR as, as your thing to worry about, and fixing it does absolutely nothing for you. So that th there was this question from social media. They said, what is the utility of a TEG, a TEG, TEG scan? Is that, I don't even know what that is. Do you, do you guys know what that is? I know what it is. You do. Okay. Uh, I uh, I don't know what that Lombo is. Elastogram. Oh, thank God we have an expert on your. <laughs> okay. And then the other. You know what's you know what's funny is a tag is a a tag is a really really old test and this this is a test from like the early days of of, of hospital medicine. I mean, literally, they would just put the blood in a cup and you put a little electrode in the middle and it measures how long a clot takes to form and then how strong of a clot forms and then. So it's really a very old test that's sort of become sexy again um, in, in hepatology circles these days. Do we get them? Yeah, we get tags frequently, but I've become kind of cynical about tags because if you do enough tags on cirrhotic patients, you will see something funny, and that is that they're all the same. Okay, and and what the what the thromboelastogram is going to end up showing you in most cirrhotics is that they're going to have a short what's called R time. And our time on the thromboelastogram is basically the time that it takes to form a clot. So cirrhotics have short R times. So guess what that means? They clot quickly. They clot quicker than the average Joe. Uh, but then there's uh, basically what you're going to see when they do form the clot, that it's going to be kind of a low amplitude on the 
on the curves that you get with a thromboelastogram. And that tells you that they don't form very strong clots. They, they, they form weak clots. And that is very, very much uh, uh, correlated with their platelet level. So the lower the platelets, the lower the amplitude, the higher the platelets, the higher the amplitude, the stronger the clot that they form. And so that's why I don't I wouldn't I don't put too much stock in tags to be honest with you because they they just really show the same same sort of pattern over and over and over again that that cirrhotics form clots quickly they just form kind of wimpy clots and and I don't know how you utilize that to fix uh, underlying bleeding problem. Um, what else? The other well the other part of the question they had was and I think you kind of already answered this with the recombinant factor 7 but FFP or vitamin K is there any role for that are you, are you using any of that are we just kind of treating the numbers making ourselves feel better? You know, we use FFP a lot when people are going for invasive procedures and stuff like that because, you know, people just can't get over the fact that fixing the INR doesn't solve any problems. So they just feel like they need that number. If the patient's going to have their gallbladder out, they want their INR less than two. And because they're doing the operation, they're doing the procedure or whatever, and they're taking that risk, you have to you have to go with that. But the bottom line is that do I advocate for giving FFP to uh, improve INRs? No. Do I, do I advocate for prothrombin complex concentrate uh, to reverse INRs? No. Do I recommend factor seven? No. And the problem is that when you give folks FFP, you give folks PCC uh, that have cirrhosis, they can and do form clots when you do this. If you, if you shift that, that tenuous balance towards the clotting side, they will form clots. They will clot off their portal vein. They will clot off their mesentery venous system. And then you've done them a big disservice. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen people go in the trolley after FFP. I mean, so these, these things do have potential downsides that you have to be cognizant of. Now, vitamin K. Vitamin K is obviously a little bit more innocuous. Um, and whether or not giving them vitamin K will work, who knows? I, in your garden variety cirrhotic, I don't typically do it because it doesn't seem to really do anything. If you have some reason to believe that they might be vitamin K deficient for some reason, like say they've been taking Coumadin or, or maybe they have chronic cholestasis, fat, uh, you know, fat soluble vitamin malabsorption for whatever reason, maybe they have cystic fibrosis, maybe they've been on chronic antibiotics, you know, some reason that they might have vitamin K deficiency, then yeah, I give them vitamin K. Why not? I you know, give them some oral vitamin K, it's about 10 milligrams daily for about three days to see if there's any improvement. But if they don't have any reason to be vitamin K deficient, giving a, a cirrhotic or decompensated cirrhotic with a prolonged INR vitamin K is not going to do anything because it's not a vitamin K issue. It's a liver synthetic function issue. Paul, you want to move us along in the case? Yeah, probably we should. So this is this is the big ticket stuff. I mean, this is all spectacular. But our patient with uh, the tensocytes at, at what we'll recall has popped out his umbilical wall hernia. Um, so we're, we've decided as a team to perform paracentesis. And I think probably the first question to even ask is just how much should we take off? Well, thank God we're finally doing a paracentesis. <laughs> That's all I have to say. We should have done it in the emergency room, Paul. No. So if you're concerned about infection in the patient, uh, just do a diagnostic paracentesis to start with. Um, and, you know, you can remove up to five liters of fluid uh, and without causing too much catastrophe with regards to post-paracentesis circulatory dysfunction. But really, your number one priority is to get enough in your syringe to make sure the patient does ha doesn't have SBP. My my for, sort of philosophy when it comes to large volume paracentesis is that this is a palliative procedure, okay? This is a comfort procedure. It doesn't serve any useful therapeutic purpose, okay? So the large volume paracentesis are, are there to make people feel better. Uh, and if you can take two or three liters off of them in the, in the emergency room and make sure that they don't have SBP and they're not going into renal failure, and maybe two days later, do a large volume paracentesis and remove the other eight liters of fluid from their belly. I think that that's probably a wise way of approaching approaching this. Um, because, you know, if somebody's got SBP and their kidneys are on the brink, do you really want to remove 15 liters of fluid uh, right up front? I, I probably wouldn't. Uh, I don't. I think that's playing with fire a little bit. We, we, so we remove the fluid. So we remove two or three liters. We send it. Any, any words of wisdom there for what fluid studies you send and how you interpret those? Yeah, absolutely. And, and this, this is very important. So the first time that you do a paracentesis on somebody, uh, you should be sending the SAG labs, if you will. So SAG stands for 
serum to ascites albumin gradient. Okay, it's one of these uh, weird concepts that if you ever really figure it out, it, it just makes everything make sense with regards to ascites and portal hypertension. But basically, if the sag is greater than 1.1, uh, so in other words, you draw the fluid out of their belly, you send the albumin from the fluid, and you also send a serum albumin at the same time, and you subtract the two. That's that's the complicated uh, math involved, right? So, and, and if that number is over 1.1, what that tells you is that the fluid in their belly is very albumin poor. Uh, there's just not much albumin in there compared to the albumin in their blood. And that should tell you immediately, that tells you from a physiologic standpoint that that fluid is being produced in the liver at the level of the hepatic sinusoid. This is, this is hepatic lymph um, is the way to think about uh, ascites. It's being pushed out of that hepatic sinusoid in volumes that is too high for the liver and the liver lymphatics to handle. And as a result, the liver just begins weeping this fluid into the abdominal, the peritoneal cavity, okay, through the capsule, everything. That's what ascites is. And that high sag tells you that that is coming from that. And why does it tell you that? Because the liver sinusoid, which is the liver's capillary, is built, is evolutionarily created to keep albumin in the blood vessel. Okay, and so even when you're pushing fluid out in the sinusoid, that albumin is going to stay in the blood vessel. It's not going to get pushed out into the into the the intracellular spaces in the liver because that sinusoid is built for that not to happen. And that's a healthy sinusoid. If you take that sinusoid and you now make it capillarized so it's lost its fenestration, you surround it with fibrosis, then albumin is even less likely to make it into that fluid. And, and in fact, even small proteins can't make it into that fluid. And as a result, that fluid becomes increasingly protein poor. And so ascites from a cirrhotic patient is very protein poor, very albumin poor, and that's why they have a high sag. And so the, the corollary to that is that you can also send a protein on the fluid, and that can be helpful in figuring out where the fluid is coming from as well. Because we know that sag is greater than 1.1. That tells us the patient has portal hypertension and the ascites is coming from the liver. But you can have portal hypertension without having liver disease necessarily, okay? So if you have post what we call post-hepatic portal hypertension, say right heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, Bud Chiari syndrome, something along those lines, you're going to have really high pressures in the sinusoids. It's going to push out hepatic lymph, but it's going to be pushing it through fairly normal sinusoids that are still fenestrated and are not surrounded by fibrosis. And as a result, you're not going to have much albumin because... Can't, albumin can't get out of the hepatic sinusoids, but you will have a lot of protein in there. And so if that protein is a high sag and low protein, that is the classic picture of cirrhotic ascites. Okay, it, it is it's just got no protein in it. If it's high sag and it has high protein, in other words, that protein level is over two and a half, then that suggests that maybe this is a post-hepatic portal hypertension and this might be coming from, maybe you should start concentrating on the heart a little bit, getting an echocardiogram, getting a Doppler to make sure their outflow as vasculature is, is appropriate. So the SAG is very important. The SAG and the protein for characterizing the ascites right off the bat is very important. Now, anytime you do a paracentesis on a patient, unless they're on hospice or something, you should be sending a cell count with differential, Okay. Every time, maybe you do the SAG the first time you ever do a tap just to, so you can characterize it. But every and every time you do a paracentesis, you should be doing a cell count with differential, okay? And the reason is this, we, this is how we're going to look for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis or SBP, okay? Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is a s situation, it's a failure of the uh, innate immunity in a cirrhotic patient uh, that basically allows bacteria to translocate get into the bloodstream, and ultimately seed the peritoneal fluid or the ascites. That acidic fluid of an cirrhotic patient, because it is so protein poor and so albumin poor, can't, they can't do anything with bacteria that translocates into that fluid. It's basically just sugar water. It's just an inoculant waiting, waiting for an infection, right? There's no... There's no immunoglobulins in there. There's no complement in there. There's nothing to opsonize the bacteria. There's no nothing. The bacteria can just go wild in there. It, so that's why these folks are at su such high risk of, of SBP. If the cell count shows more than 250 PMNs, neutrophils, um, that is the diagnosis of SBP. So they can have 400 nucleated cells and 
Uh, only 10% are PMNs. That's not SBP. Okay, that's 40. They, they they could be all monocytes and all kinds of things. That That is not indicative of an infection. But if they have the PMNs are over 250, uh, then that is SBP. Unless you have some obvious reason that they don't have, that this wouldn't be SBP, like say a bullet wound in their abdomen, you know, some reason they might have a perforated viscous, they have a surgical abdomen, you know, if, if they have peritonitis, peritonitis for some reason, then yeah, they're going to have elevated, um, uh, uh, neutrophils in their fluid as well. But if, if you don't have any suggestion that they have some kind of perforated viscous or intra-abdominal infection and they have S and they have PMNs greater than 250, that's SBP. Oftentimes when you do the fluid, you'll notice it'll be very cloudy rather than a kind of mountain dew or urine appearance of typical ascites. It'll be cloudy, very, very milky looking uh, fluid. So one of the important things, if you're worried about SBP, and this is one of the take-home points for your audience, is if, if you're worried about SBP and you're doing a diagnostic paracentesis and you're going to send a culture, you're going to inoculate a blood culture vial at bedside, okay? This this is how you do it. You don't put it in one of those little urine cups and send it to the lab. Don't don't put it in some other culturette sort of thing and send it to the lab later on. You're going to inoculate a blood culture vial at the bedside. And the reason that we do that is that it increases the yield for positive cultures by almost 30% uh, over sending cultures in, in little jars or whatever um, at, at later at later time. So... Those are the basics of, of fluid and fluid um, analysis of, of acidic fluid. Uh, in this guy, you want to get it, send the sag, but send the cell count, inoculate yourself a blood culture vial, vial right there beside it, and send it off for culture. And that, that's what you want to do right off the bat. Scott, I just I wanted to check one thing: the for for heart heart failure, you said there's if we're looking at the acidic fluid protein or post hepatic causes of like this um of ascites you said there would be high protein and then the sag would be high or low high high sag high. as well okay because even in even in that situation the, the the ascites is being produced in the liver it's being produced in the sinusoid it's it's the sinusoids are producing it because they're congested with with blood that can't get out and there's high pressure there you know, I always think of ascites as just thinking back to your old starling forces or whatever from medical school about why, you know, we produce lymph at every capillary in our body. We have the whole lymphatic system that, that sucks that back up and sends it out. It's a it's the balance between hydrostatic forces, oncotic pressures, and stuff like that. And a cirrhotic patient or a patient with heart failure, they have increased hydrostatic pressure in their capillary, so they're going to push more fluid out. They're going to, they also have low oncotic pressure because they don't have a lot of albumin floating around. So their net movement of fluid is going to be out of that capillary system. Um, so that that's just basically how ascites is produced. So you may ask me, what does a low sag mean? So if the sag is less than is less than 1.1, what does that mean? Well, that means that your ascites and your fluid is nearly the same as the I mean, sorry, the albumin in your fluid is nearly the same as the albumin in your serum, and that equals not the liver. So that, that ascites is not being produced in the liver. That ascites is being produced somewhere else. And that's why low sag ascites is stuff like infections, malignancy, peritoneal carcinomatosis, renal failure, pancreatitis. You know, that, that fluid is coming from somewhere inside the abdomen, but it's not coming from the liver. So that's why, that's why the sag is so important and just telling you where that fluid is coming from. Fantastic. I love it. So let's let's say we we do our, our due diligence. We send off our fluid studies, including the the critical cell count with differential and and the SAG, and we do determine that we think this is SBP. So I guess a, a good place to start is what what should we be doing to treat this? I feel like is a a reasonable question to ask ourselves. So what antibiotics do you choose? How long do you treat for? And then what other considerations are there? Yeah, so that's a great question. With SBP in general, you need to start treating this as as soon as possible, and and typically the treatment is with a third generation cephalosporin again that's that's a classic treatment though uh, some people are arguing in this day and age of multi drug resistant organisms that we may be needing to do more aggressive antibiotics but at this point i would say that third generation cephalosporins are the uh, first choice for this uh, uh, to this point um, the treatment duration is typically about five days of iv antibiotics um, People always want to switch to oral antibiotics, and you can switch to oral fluoroquinolones uh, at, at some point, but I typically like to give a good five days of, of IV ceftriaxone before I do that. 
The other treatment point that's fairly important with regards to SPP is albumin. And um, one of the seminal studies in uh, hepatology was the SORT paper from 1999 in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they gave albumin at 1.5 grams per kilogram on day one of SBP diagnosis. And they gave it again, gave one gram per kilogram on day three. And the difference between those groups was fairly dramatic. Mortality was decreased from 29% in the patients who did not get albumin to 10% in the patients that did get albumin. So getting albumin on day one and three with SBP is very, uh, very important. There has been some studies suggesting you don't need to do it if they're, um, unless their creatinine is greater than one or their billy is greater than four. But I don't like to play with that sort of fire. I, I typically just, if they have SBP, they get albumin. They have looked at albumin in other infections in cirrhosis, like pneumonia, urinary tract infections, and it doesn't seem to work. It, it seems to be, it seems to only decrease mortality in SBP uh, for whatever reason. And that likely is very related to the development of hepatorenal syndrome, which is oftentimes how people with SBP die. So hepatorenal syndrome uh, is a very complicated uh, topic physiologically. Uh, the way I think about this is that um, basically having cirrhosis leads to very disordered cardiovascular uh, blood flow. And, and cirrhotic patients tend to have a lot of blood pooled in their mesentery. And when I say the mesentery, I mean their you know, superior mesenteric artery and vein, the inferior mesenteric artery and vein, all the, all the gut uh, uh, blood vessels are overly and inappropriately dilated in cirrhotic patients. As a result, a lot of their blood volume is inappropriately hanging out in their gut, and their systemic blood volume is low, and their arterial blood, systemic arterial blood pressure tends to get low as a result. Now, the body tends to the reason for this is very complicated and it has to do with nitric oxide and bad humors. But um, basically what, what the result is, is because you have low circulating uh, uh, blood volume and low arterial blood pressure, your kidney doesn't like that. Um, it senses that your brain senses that and they start releasing hormones and other uh, vasoactive substances in an effort to try to get your systemic arterial blood pressure up. But you can't get your systemic arterial blood pressure up because the liver is going to keep everything pulled in the gut. And it leads to this vicious cycle of worsening vasoconstriction uh, in the periphery uh, from renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, vasopressin, uh, adrenergic outflow, uh, you name it. And the bottom line is that the kidneys basically squeeze themselves off and start to become dysfunctional. Um, they, they, they basically kill themselves trying to get your blood pressure uh, to go up. And now hepatorenal physio, you'll hear me say hepatorenal physiology. And I'll tell you that I believe that everyone with portal hypertension has hepatorenal physiology. Okay, they, they exist on a spectrum somewhere on, in hepatorenal physiology. Um, whether it's fairly mild and you can't really detect it all the way up to their kidneys no longer work and if they don't get transplanted they'll die okay so type 1 hepatorenal syndrome is when you go from being normal kidney function to dead aneuric kidneys in just a matter of a few days and if you don't transplant those folks they die okay and and that's how sbp tends to kill people it it, it triggers this catastrophic um, cycle of, of hepatorenal physiology that leads to the kidneys failing, the liver failing, everything fails, and, and people tend to die. But you can also have type 2 hepatorenal physiology, and, and um, that's a slower process. Those are the people that exist on that continuum somewhere where they do have this dysfunctional circulation uh, of, of uh, hepatorenal physiology, but they don't necessarily have kidney failure. Uh, these people will manifest not so much as elevated creatinines because, you know, your creatinine is not going to go up until you've lost at least 40 percent of your renal function. OK, so MDRD and whatever are going to uh, not adequately describe this situation. But we, what you will see with these people is you're unable to get them on diuretics. You can't control their ascites with diuretics. Um, they get hyponatremic. Hyponatremia for me is a sign of this hepatorenal physiology. This is your kidneys becoming dysfunctional. This is too much antidiuretic hormone flooding out of the brain trying to fix this problem. And you end up with this global hyponatremia. Every time you touch them with Lasix, their sodium drops like a bomb. This 
this is uh, this is hepatorenal uh, at it, at its worst, and this is why hyponatremia is such a uh, negative prognostic sign in cirrhotics. And this is why this is why sodium was added to the MELD score as as a prognostic indicator. So now we deal with MELD sodium on the people on the transplant list because we know that low sodium, that's a sign of very bad circulatory dysfunction in the cirrhotic patient that is only at some point in the very near future going to dive off the hepatorenal cliff uh, into full blown renal failure. I forgot what I was talking about, but there you go. All right, so, um, and this is important with, with regards to paracentesis in general, why we should be giving folks albumin, okay? And, and not, not, only, not only with SVP, uh, but with large volume paracentesis as well. Um, you can, uh, you can if, you give, if you remove more than five liters of fluid from a cirrhotic um, without giving them albumin and repletion, you can get uh, a post-paracentesis circulatory dysfunction, which can very easily kick off this hepatorenal physiology and le- lead to renal failure. So if you move, remove more than five liters of fluid of paracentesis, you've got to give uh, 25% albumin. Uh, and um, there are cal- you can do six to eight grams per liter if you're a calculator. But uh, for me, if I remove more than five liters, I give them 50 grams of albumin. If I get close to 10, I give them another 25 grams of albumin. If I get close to 15, I give them another 25. I usually max out at 100 grams. I don't usually give much more than that. Uh, but that that's just an effort to keep their blood where it's supposed to be and keep them from in, entering this uh, horrific cycle that leads to death. Scott, I wanted to just ask a follow-up about the, the antibiotic thing. I was reading that you should see a dramatic improvement in their symptoms uh, once you have them on antibiotics. And if at five days, they're still not looking right, they're still having a lot of pain or fevers or whatever, you should repeat the para. And then based on the, the PMNs in the fluid, you kind of make your decision. Is that is that actually done in practice? I haven't seen that done before, but I just something I read about. Uh, absolutely no. I I think you should have a very low threshold to repeat the paracentesis at the end of the five days and make sure they've cleared the infection. The thing to remember about SBP is that this is a silent infection. You, you they don't necessarily have symptoms. They don't necessarily have fever or abdominal pain. Their first presentation might be aneuric renal failure from hepatorenal syndrome, or their first presentation might be encephalopathy. Their first presentation might be a variceal bleed. You, you don't know if this infection is gone until you've sampled the fluid and made sure that the infection is gone. So I have, I don't always do it. If a patient's clearly clinically getting b- much better, I don't necessarily repeat the paracentesis at day five. But if I have any doubt, or if the infection was very severe to begin with, a really high PMN count, or they were really, really sick, then yeah, absolutely. I, I would repeat it at five days and see if I don't need to give this person antibiotics for a longer period of time. And you also got to remember that once somebody gets this, they are on antibiotics for life after this. And that's that's what you have to remember, that you have to have this person on secondary prophylaxis for the rest of their life. And that's typically with ciprofloxacin, um, 250 or 500 milligrams a day, depending on which which guidelines you believe, um, but they have to be on that for life a- after the SBP. That's that's uh, mandatory. They're poor. They're poor tendons. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> Achilles. <laughs> You're a goner. Someone someone from social media was asking about like draining all the fluid. You know, tap them till they're dry. I think you sort of answered that. You said that basically you you got to be careful. You know, initially do the diagnostic, maybe a smaller volume, and then. If if you can't get the fluid off or if you need to get more fluid off, you can do that later once they're more stabilized. Well, I will tell you that hepatologists and nephrologists have very different opinions on this uh, on this question about how much fluid we should be removing. They uh, hepatologists, you know, we we run around with our personal best, you know, like <laughs> like hey, I, I, like mine is eighteen and a half liters. But oh my the, gosh! Uh, one of my colleagues is twenty three liters. You know, so we. We have our we have our personal records, and and most a lot of the hepatologists I know we we don't worry about how much volume we remove. Now, like I said, in an acute setting where you think they're infected, it's probably not wise to do a huge volume paracentesis. But if if uh, you're just bringing a patient in for a random routine paracentesis, I tap them till they're dry, um, and just give them albumin. But um, some nephrologists would argue that we shouldn't be doing that. But I don't know that the data is clear on that. And once you, uh, if their blood pressure can tolerate, then these people are going on. We talked about this on the last episode. I think this was our hundredth episode that you, we had you on. Maybe the hundred first one where we actually talked about diuretics. But uh, you would put them on the diuretics at that point if they're not diuretic re- refractory. 
Yeah, diuretics very important. Um, this is obviously the the main therapy for ascites. But the the other thing that you have to put them on is a low sodium diet, and you um, it's hard to underestimate the importance of that. You you can defeat any amount of diuretics with sodium intake each day, and and a, a significant portion of patients with quote unquote refractory ascites um, actually are quite uh, uh, non compliant with a, a low sodium diet. Um, so that that the first step in the management is a low sodium diet. A second step in management is diuretics. I wanted to end uh, this case here, and, and before before we get some take home points from you. So the the case that Paul had given you, this patient not only uh, did he have abdominal pain, and we diagnosed the hepatic um, or sorry the SBP, but he also had hepatic encephalopathy. And I wanted to ask you, kind of. A patient coming in the hospital, let's say he was he was encephalopathic, not to the point where he had to be intubated, but he was his mental status was terrible. Other than treating the SBP, what else w- should we be doing in the hospital for that? And is there any interesting physiology to talk about? You know, in in what's causing this? What the encephalopathy? Yeah, do we know what's causing it yet? Yeah, well, encephalopathy. There's a couple of things to to realize about encephalopathy. <clears throat> Number one is that this encephalopathy tends to be a shunt phenomenon. I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier in the podcast. Um, encephalopathy is a complex uh, condition that results from shunting of blood around the liver, as well as uh, complex interactions uh, with the brain and ammonia and other other mediators. But if I put a shunt in you, Dr. Watto, I mean, there, there would be a chance that you would become encephalopathic. You, you can become encephalopathic um, with a shunt, whether you have cirrhosis or not. The decreased uh, function of a cirrhotic liver does make it worse. It makes it m- more likely to develop encephalopathy. But I don't think of encephalopathy as a, uh, a phenomenon of liver f- failure in, in a cirrhotic patient. I think it more of a shunting phenomenon. Right? These people are shunting blood around their liver, uh, and as a result, they become encephalopathic. Okay, you see this when we give somebody a tips, right? You get a tips, they get encephalopathic afterwards because they're shunting blood. Now, um, how do we, what, how should we approach encephalopathy? Well, the thing, the way you should approach encephalopathy is that, is that hepatic encephalopathy is a sign of another problem that you have not diagnosed yet. Okay. Hepatic encephalopathy is not your major concern. Your major concern should be what the heck is causing this encephalopathy? What is precipitating this encephalopathy? Because the things that precipitate encephalopathy are deadly if not diagnosed. Okay. Number one on your to-do list should be ruling out infection. And, you know, we've talked about SBP ad nauseum, um, but other infections, even the most minor of infections can trigger encephalopathy. Urinary tract infections are notorious for doing it. Skin infections, you name it. Any kind of little infection can trigger in- encephalopathy. Bleeding is your next thing. Uh, you know, a big gut meal full of blood uh, will trigger encephalopathy fairly frequently. So you got to figure out, is this person variceal bleeding and I don't know it? Um, then you start thinking about over medications. Are they on benzodiazepines or narcotics? All of these things are very much so will trigger um, uh, encephalopathy. More than one time, I've had patient, you know, who their well-meaning primary care doctor put them on Ambien or Lunesta or something to help them sleep because all of my patients have insomnia, and then they come in densely encephalopathic as a result. They can't they can't handle those uh, anything that's gabinergic. Uh, under medication is also in your differential, so non-adherence to their medicines. So lactulose sucks. No one likes taking lactulose, and uh, it grows, and it makes you poop a lot. So people not taking their medicine is very common. Uh, you have to think about electrolyte issues like hypokalemia in particular. Hypokalemia has an actual physiologic effect in the kidney that leads to increased ammonia production, and uh, so hypokalemia has to be fixed. Volume depletion is very common in our patients if they're over or are having too many bowel movements for their lactulose. But you also have to think about, is there something causing increasing shunting? Do they have a new portal vein thrombosis? Do they have a liver cancer? Uh, something like that. So getting something like a liver Doppler uh, just to make sure. So these these are the things that you have to run through your mind each and every time a patient comes in encephalopathy and make sure you're kind of ruling these things out. Wow. It's, it's just a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> well, that's, that's why I'm here, Dr. Watto. I can always take the load off your back. <laughs> Okay. 
any other any other tips that you have for hepatic encephalopathy? And I, I apologize for the pun. The t- you know, I that was not meant to be a pun. I'm just asking, are there any uh, other God. is there any more advice that you have? It's a bad pun because tips is an awful treatment. For yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the absolute worst. And also there are no good puns. So really just by definition. You no, know, there are a couple of good uh, treatment nuggets for encephalopathy. So encephalopathy um really uh, when a patient comes in with encephalopathy and you've already done your differential and made sure they're not going to die of something else, when you're when you're concentrating on on treating the encephalopathy, catharsis is what you're looking for here. We got to make them poop and poop a lot uh, to start with on day one. And um, what you don't want to do is bring them in and put la- put them on their home dose of lactulose and just expect that to work. Okay, lactulose is still, in my opinion, the 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 absolute frontline therapy for this. You want to give them a lot of lactulose fairly frequently until they are having regular, regular bowel movements. You can titrate it on day two and three when they're waking up uh, to the normal three to four bowel movements a day that we're looking for. But on day one, you want them pooping and pooping a lot. Now, there was a study uh, that came out, uh, what, a year ago uh, where they looked at uh, using PEG or, you know, a liter of Go Lightly. This was in 2014 in JAMA. Uh, they they gave folks four liters of uh, polyethylene glycol up front to get them pooping. And guess what? They actually got they got better from the encephalopathy standpoint faster than the people that were uh, given lactulose a standard way. So everybody's like, oh, we should be giving Go Lightly. The problem is if you look at the study, 84% of the folks that got PEG got lactulose before they started getting the PEG. And so we currently think, you know, if you want to give PEG as your way of catharsis on day one, that's great. Just give them some lactulose too. So it's so a lactulose plus PEG or lactulose. You just want them pooping very aggressively on day one. How do you give them the lactulose? How do you give them the PEG? This is important because then we're hearkening back to the very beginning of the podcast where I told you, you have to pay attention to their mental status and you have to worry about their airway. You have to worry about aspiration. You don't want to be adding an infection to this picture. Okay. So if a person is obtunded and gargling and can't even uh, say their name, you don't want to be trying to feed them oral lactulose. The nice thing is that lactulose works very nicely as an enema. Um, it, it, it has the same effect as taking it orally. And, uh, that is my preferred go-to method for giving them when they're really, really, uh, obtunded. I usually give them PR lactulose until they can more adequately wake up. You could in theory put down an NG tube, but I think if you look at NG tubes, uh, the data on them and preventing aspiration, you'll find that they, people aspirate quite nicely with NG tubes in, uh, when you're putting stuff down into their stomach. So I, I typically prefer PR uh, lactulose to PO when they're really significantly encephalopathic. The nurses hate it. Yeah, I was going to say, the, but, do the nurses hate it? And how does the patient oh, hold the enema if they're, you know, kind of out of it? It's just sort of... I don't know that you necessarily need them to hold it for too long. You just got to squirt some up in there. Okay. So basically, basically lactulose really works by, you know, acidifying the the lumen of the colon. Um and uh, that's been shown in some early studies. You know, I, I just to give a, a props to one of my colleagues, uh, Elliot Tapper, um, who's a hepatologist in Michigan, has quite a Twitter um, uh, following and is very active on Twitter. And he did a tutorial on hepatic encephalopathy back in September of last year that was just absolutely fantastic. I, I retweeted, retweeted it on my uh, on my uh, Twitter feed. Uh, it was just a very impressively done tutorial about how to attack and deal with encephalopathy on your inpatient patients. So I would definitely recommend that your listeners check that out and check him out in general. He just does really good uh, liver type tweets. That we can definitely put that in the show notes. I, I think I, I feel like I did see that when it was, when it was out there, Paul, any other questions that we should ask, or you think we're, think we're at a point to get take home points and we'll just have to do a part three. No, I think we solved cirrhosis. I feel I feel pretty good about it. So, <laughs> strong work team. Certainly Done. feel better than I did before. Yeah, well, we yeah. didn't we didn't talk about Rifaximin, so I'll just add a little uh, blivet there because that was on the on the questions. Rifaximin is your second line therapy for encephalopathy. This is a non-absorbable antibiotic. Um, 
Hepatologists absolutely love rifaximin. I just want you to know it's our favorite drug. It has great benefits for our patients. It's good for encephalopathy. I typically use it with lactulose or in a patient that simply cannot tolerate any non-absorbable disaccharides for their encephalopathy. The thing to know about rifaximin is it is vastly expensive in the neighborhood of $2,000 a month. Um, so just just think about that when you're putting your patient on it. You sh- this should not be a first line, first time they ever have encephalopathy type medication. This is for a patient that's failed uh, lactulose alone. Wow, two thousand a month. Uh, hopefully, uh, any is that going to be generic anytime soon? So that I guess that doesn't even matter these days. Generic drugs sometimes are not no, even it's, that. It's one of those I think that's been bought up by one of these. Uh, hedge fund type things of Jack, because it didn't used to be 2000. It used to be 1600, but it got, got more expensive recently. It should be generic. It's been out for more than seven years, but the culture scene story. Yep. Let's get some take home points, Scott, so we can let you, I mean, we can't thank you enough for all this teaching, but we, at some point we have to let you go. And, uh, you know, we'll just have to build up some more questions about, about the liver for you. All right, so my main take-home points for you, number one is any cirrhotic with any complaint with ascites is SBP until proven otherwise. Just just drill that into your head. This is just sort of like the same thing with, you know, any female between the ages of 12 and 60 that comes in the hospital with any complaint is pregnant until proven otherwise. It's a very, very similar kind of, uh, of rule. Um if you're going to rule out SBP, make sure you're doing your cultures in a blood culture vial at bedside uh, while you're doing the tap. Uh, that makes a significant difference when it comes to yield of the culture. Um, understand the concept of acute on chronic liver failure and how this differs um, from decompensated cirrhosis. Uh, and then basically stop checking the ammonia levels, people. Please, I'm begging you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think we could do that. I, I think our audience... Uh, you know, they'll just, just picture Scott hissing at you like a cat, which is, <laughs> I've actually, since we, since we talked the first time, we, that, that came up as well. And I've been, I say that to my team whenever I'm like, if I were the, if I were Dr. Matherly, I would be hissing at you like a cat right now. Right. And I think they get it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, that's all I got guys. I'm out of knowledge for you for the evening. <laughs> we, we got to let you get back to... Whatever else you have planned, I'm sure. I'm sure that this is not the most important part of your night. So, thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me, guys. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I love talking about the liver, and I appreciate you giving me this platform. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. There we go. Thank you. And get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. We're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate and review the show on iTunes. It really helps us and helps other people find the show. You can also contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks goes to our writers and producers for this episode, Justin Lee Burke and Nora Toronto, and to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams, and goodbye. And I think what I really like about him is he talks about them. He describes them as tenuous as they actually are. Like, is you need to do this or they're going to die. Their, their mortality is very high. If you don't do this, you'll kill them. Like, it's I, it's very. He reinforces how sick these patients are, which is one. Of the, and then talks about the pathophys. Like, he's such a great guest. <laughs>